Um, my name is Laylee. I'm the CEO of the Tahereh Justice Center. And on September 25th, 2017, on Sunday when much of the world was distracted by um, NFL protests, the president, executed, uh, the president executed the third executive order. Um, there have been two travel ban executive orders, uh, each attempting to correct the legal problems and the lack of constitutionality of the earlier ones. Um, this executive order is in fact more sweeping and more broad than even the last executive orders. And so while I think the world is both exhausted because of all these executive orders, but also substantively distracted on, on Sunday, um, I'm afraid this executive order has, has not received the attention um, that it is due. Um, in any case, I'll do my best to explain it. What I will say, though, is that this executive order is very, very complicated, and I would not recommend that anyone based on this video make any legal decisions. Um, it's very complicated, and so I'm going to have to stay high level around it. So if you are from one of the eight countries that is affected by this executive order, please don't make any significant immigration or legal decisions based on this video, because really you should talk to an immigration lawyer. These executive orders are extremely um, complicated, and I wouldn't want anything that I say for you to rely on legally, because um, frankly, the last executive orders were much more broad, much more sweeping. This one is very particular for each country. It's very tailored. And so it really requires a skilled and very specific examination if you are from one of these eight countries. So again, don't make any legal, legal decisions based on this video alone. Please do talk to an immigration lawyer. So just to give you some context, the other executive order, um, as I mentioned, there have been two. Uh, the second one was trying to correct some of the legal and constitutional problems of the first one was scheduled for oral arguments in front of the Supreme Court in just over a week. Um, the Supreme Court, understandably, has canceled those oral arguments, and now they've asked all of the parties, and Tahare um, has submitted a brief in that case, and so us and, and everybody else, uh, the, the primary parties, have been asked to submit legal arguments to argue to the Supreme Court why the case shouldn't simply be dismissed now because it should be considered moot. The reality is now the case is largely moot because the old executive order has been, um, uh, they killed it basically in this new executive order and only this new executive order is what is applying now. Now there's some similar legal issues in both of them, but the old executive order is now considered moot. And so the legal parties will argue that, and I don't know what the Supreme Court will do. But really, the only thing I wanted to say about that is what a colossal, incredible waste of time this is. Um, there are over 50 lawsuits that have been brought against this travel ban because it was unconstitutional. It was not legally well thought out. It was not, they didn't consult um, with the right, even government agencies before issuing it. And as a result, there were all kinds of legal problems and there were over 50 lawsuits brought on it. On each of those lawsuits, there were between 10 and 100 amicus briefs filed. So the primary parties filed the briefs, then amicus briefs were filed, which means friend of the court. Tahereh submitted 14 of those and many, many, many other organizations. So you could only imagine with over 50 lawsuits, each one having between 10 and 100 amicus briefs filed, each one of those lawsuits, each one of those amicus briefs, and each one of the organizations or parties that brought them had a team of lawyers behind them at large law firms, at nonprofit legal services organizations. And I don't know, I mean, if you just even guesstimate that each of those lawyers were like an average, and this is cheap for a corporate lawyer, $300 an hour, and that's not even counting the time of the government lawyers who have to defend each of those lawsuits and require a legal team themselves. The amount of money and time that has been wasted on these cases should really be a concern to people of all political parties and of all persuasions, um, because it's just a waste of our country's resources um, and, and frankly frustrating, as you can tell, <laughs> I feel. Okay, so the details of the executive orders. First, let me tell you uh, who it applies to and who it doesn't apply to. This executive order does not at all apply to refugees. The last executive orders affected people 
who were immigrants and non-immigrant visa applicants and holders, as well as refugees, they have segregated out the refugee component. And we expect an executive order to be issued on the refugee part in a few days. So we're staying tuned for that. But not the last executive order is conflated if, uh, refugees and immigrants. This one separates them, and this only applies to immigrants specifically. Okay. Um, then it only applies to individuals from eight countries. Notably, they switched into new countries and took out one country. This executive order applies to individuals from Chad, Libya, Yemen, Iran, North Korea, Syria, Somalia, and Venezuela. Sudan has been dropped. They were in the previous list, uh, in the previous executive orders, added are Chad, North Korea, and Venezuela. Um, now, what's really confusing is why these countries were chosen. In the executive order, there was mention of a report that was given to the president analyzing security and identity uh, integrity information from a wide range of countries. In that report, 31 countries were identified as posing a potential security risk. Um, given the factors that it explains in the executive order. 16 of those countries were elevated, so there were 31 they said there were problems with, and then 16 of those were elevated um, of particular concern. And then randomly, without any explanation at all of those 16, uh, in this executive order, eight have been chosen uh, for travel ban exclusion. We don't know why. They don't explain why. Um, the inclusion of Chad is really perplexing and the inclusion of North Korea, particularly considering the fact that last year in North Korea, we only admitted nine, less than 10 uh, immigrants total from North Korea. And arguably for those of us, for example, who lived during the 1980s, not unlike the Soviet Union at the time, anyone who could get themselves out of North Korea into the United States, and, and defects deserves our protection, but for some reason they are now also being included. Okay, um, something else that this executive order does that the other one did not is it treats every country differently. The last executive order applied the policies in the executive order to all of the countries affected by the travel ban. This executive order has very particularized treatment of every country that's implicated in this executive order. And I'll explain um, each country individually. Okay. Um, when does it go into effect? The executive order goes into effect immediately for individuals who were subject to the last executive order. Basically what that means is all the restrictions in the last executive order um, for the countries remaining from the last executive order now will continue indefinitely. And that last executive order was supposed to expire after 90 days. The ban goes into effect for the newly added countries or for individuals that were seeking an exemption under the last executive order. So um, you may recall that the last executive order basically banned people, but for those who had a bona fide relationship with an individual or an entity in the United States. That bona fide relationship um, has now been eliminated. Now it won't matter if you have any relationship uh, with people in the United States. So for the new countries, they never get the benefit of that bona fide relationship exemption. For those other countries in the executive order who are remaining, um, for them, it goes into effect on October 18th. Again, this is a very complicated executive order. Um, please do not rely on this video to make legal or immigration decisions. You will need to talk to an immigration lawyer. Um, the executive order is indefinite with no end time. The last executive order expired after a certain period of time. And then for all the categories that are being banned in this executive order, it, it, it says that it's possible to apply on a case by case basis for an exemption if you can show three things, the three things you have to show for an exemption. 
are one is undue hardship to the individual being excluded. Now, there's a lot of case law on what undue hardship is, and it's really extreme things. It can't be inconvenience. It's like dying of cancer or um, even we've had clients that we've tried to apply for undue hardship waivers for whose mother was dying in her home country. They We wanted our client to be able to go back to the funeral it was denied. So undue hardship has a very, very high bar, but you have to prove that. Then you have to prove that the individual's entry to the United States would not pose a threat to the United States or public safety. Um, so it's a negative proof. You have to prove they would not pose a threat. Finally, the third element for this exemption is to prove that their entry would be in the national interest. This is what makes the exemption uh, nearly impossible, I think, for most people to get. In order to show that someone's entry would be in the national interest, um, that would likely only be possible in a case that had was very high profile, was in the newspapers, or somebody that would particularly advantage the United States by coming into the country. Um, also, this executive order does not apply to those who currently have lawful permanent resident status. What that means is if you have a green card, you're safe. It will not be taken away from you, but do not lose that green card <laughs> and be very careful when you are traveling. Um, if you are eligible for US citizenship, I highly recommend that you apply for that citizenship. If you hang on to lawful permanent residence, there is some risk, but this particular travel ban does not apply to you. If you are dual national, a dual national, and you travel on your non-affected passport, so for example, if you have an Iranian passport and a Canadian passport, and you travel to the United States on your Canadian passport, you will be okay. If you have um, a diplomatic visa, you're okay. If you currently have a valid visa, so let's say you're in the United States as a student from one of these eight countries, or you're on a visitor's visa from one of these eight countries, you are safe. You can stay here, you won't be kicked out. But if your visa expires and you have to reapply for that visa, it will be denied. It also does not apply to individuals who've been granted asylum, refugee status, withholding of removal, advanced parole, or protection against the Convention Against Torture Act. This is that bit that I mentioned where they have segregated out these humanitarian forms of relief um, and we expect another executive order to be issued on refugee status and other issues similar to that. Okay, so that's who it applies to and who it doesn't apply to. Now, how does it apply to specific countries? Um, Venezuela. Visitors are not going to be allowed from Venezuela. Certain government officials and their families are being banned. If you're from Venezuela and you currently have a, a visa, um, including a visitor's visa, you will be subject to additional measures. No idea what that means. There's no legal definition for that and they don't explain it. Somalia, if you're from Somalia, all immigrant visas are banned and non-immigrant visas. So this is a broader banning than Venezuela is subject to. This includes visitors' visas, and, or sorry, and then, okay, sorry. All immigrant visas are banned and non-immigrant visas like visitors' visas will be subject to additional scrutiny. Okay, so, and then again, I don't have any idea what additional scrutiny means. They don't define it here. Um, and, and so we really don't know what that means. Chad, Libya, and Yemen, all immigrant visas are banned and all visitors' visas are banned. So that is a broader ban um, that applies to those countries. North Korea and Syria, all immigrant and non-immigrant visas are banned, um, the most broad banning possible. Iran, all immigrant and non-immigrant visas are banned. So it is, the, it is a similar broadest banning um, as North Korea and Syria, except there are um, two exceptions. Student visas, which are F and M visas, and exchange visitors visas. 
So J visas from Iran are exempted. Um, there are a lot of students from Iran, and so I think this exemption will be a relief to many. Um, I think, though, what will be a surprise to many from Iran under this visa is that all family members are included. There is no longer an exemption for family members to be able to come to the United States. And the ban is permanent. It doesn't have the limited time frame that the other executive order had. Then with regard to Iran, there's additional language that says all of those visas will be subject to enhanced screening and vetting requirements. It's interesting to me how they use really different phrases um, for each country. For one, they say additional scrutiny. For another, they say additional measures. And then yet for another country, they say enhanced screening and vetting requirements. These are subjective phrases that have no legal definition, and so we really don't know what they mean by that. But the harsh reality is that many visas decisions are made behind closed doors, and so vague language like that would really allow them to deny visas on almost any basis um, couched or cloaked in that kind of broad language. Um, so that's really it in terms of what this executive order says. Um, some have asked what the legal strategy or thinking is against these executive orders. Currently, advocates around the country are scrambling right now in order to develop legal strategies to oppose this executive order in recognition that it really summarily excludes huge groups, large populations of people from around the country. Um, and coming from countries where individuals fleeing those countries are suffering the most. It appears to dilute the previous executive order's emphasis on Muslim communities by throwing in North Korea and Venezuela. Um, but again, it's unclear why those two countries were included when 16 countries total were identified by the report that the president relied on or says he relied on when issuing this executive order. Um, in some ways, there will be strong legal arguments against this executive order because the language around issuing them is very vague and clothed in national security concerns, but there's no evidence statistically that individuals from those countries pose a particular national threat to the United States. In other ways, though, it will be more difficult to challenge this executive order than the other executive order, namely because it's so specific from country to country. Um, and, and then the reasons they give are very vague, but framed in this clandestine language about national security reports that we aren't able to view. Um, so it's going to make the characterization of the executive order as a whole more difficult. Um, so there are legal uh, challenges and arguments that can be made, but no doubt this executive order is much more difficult to challenge. So we're all waiting with bated breath for the executive order that relates to refugees. We still don't know. Um, and I hope this has been somewhat helpful, but let me say, I think for the third time, please don't rely on anything that I've said in order to make legal decisions for yourself or your family, because this executive order is extremely complicated and you really do need an immigration lawyer's advice to navigate it. Thanks so much. Take care.